Well, good morning. If I could welcome everyone to Auburn University, I've got the uh, absolute pleasure to, to, to host our second uh, in a series, our Leaders on the Plane series. We recently had uh, Admiral Mike Rogers uh, in to kick it off, uh, and now we're featuring uh, Admiral David Pekoski. Um, I, I, I also have the privilege uh, to, to introduce our uh, um, Congressman, Mike Rogers, who incredibly uh, ably uh, serves the third district of Alabama. Um, he's been a phenomenal friend uh, uh, to Auburn University, but I think more apropos to today's topic, in addition to the support he's provided to, to Auburn University, He's been a leader on all homeland security and national security issues in Washington. So he fights for the, the third district, he fights for Auburn, um, and he also served, serves currently as the ranking member of the Homeland Security Committee in Washington. Uh, he previously served uh, as the uh, subcommittee chairman for transportation security in the House Homeland Security Committee. And he's also a ranking, uh, a senior member of the House Armed Services Committee where I think all of you know he's, uh, he's been a huge proponent for our space programs, for our national security issues, uh, uh, and, and an absolute pleasure to, to be able to have Congressman Mike Rogers introduce Admiral Pekoski. I, I might also note we have uh, an amazing group of our university leadership here. I want to recognize President Gouge uh, first and foremost. Our uh, luminary uh, board of trustees, thank you for taking some time to, 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 to join us this morning. And I have to mention my namesake, the Charles McCrary Institute, Charles McCrary, who's just been uh, an amazing friend uh, of Auburn University. He's been serving on the trustees for uh, a number of years and a good friend and mentor to me. So without further ado, I want to get this going quickly. I would like to, to, to welcome Congressman Mike Rogers to the podium. Thank you. I appreciate you inviting me uh, to be here. I'm always, uh, as ranking member of the Homeland Security Committee, uh, thrilled to see my district uh, play a role in keeping our country uh, safe. And, uh, and I've always been proud and remain very proud of Auburn University and uh, their leading role in developing canine science and uh, particularly explosive detection canine uh, capabilities. Uh, throughout my time in Congress, I've come to believe strongly that canines play a crucial role in the protection of our transportation systems. Every day, millions of Americans are protected by reliable, explosive detection canines who stand guard at our airports, train stations, and mass transit hubs. Many of these canine teams are led, uh, have, are led to fund, uh, led or funded by the Transportation Security Administration. That's why I'm so pleased to have TSA's Administrator, Admiral Dave Pekowski, with us today. Uh, since his confirmation as head of TSA in 2017, Admiral Pekowski has made tremendous strides in implementing the administration's effort to raise the global baseline of aviation security. He's brought the sense of duty and determined leadership he learned during his years of service in the United States Coast Guard to the TSA. As many of you are aware, uh, Mr. Pekowski has served much of the last year as acting director of the Department of Homeland Security. While we greatly appreciate his service in that role, I'm really pleased to see him back in the daily helm of TSA, uh, where he will no doubt continue to lead with distinction and I hope fulfill his five-year term, uh, which is a step was established by Congress in this year's TSA Modernization Act. The reality is that TSA is the public face of DHS, interacting with uh, well over two million passengers every day. With that, I look forward to hearing from Admiral, Ad, the Admiral's perspective today on what lies ahead for the future of TSA and the progress he's made during his tenure as Administrator. Ladies and gentlemen, Admiral Dave Pekoski. Well, Admiral, thank you for joining us uh, here in beautiful uh, Auburn. Thank you. And uh, I, I understand you've been busy already in Alabama and Birmingham. Uh, we have. Out the in, airport. in Birmingham, Montgomery airports, I uh, got to meet the TSA teams at both those airports. And, you know, really, I think anybody who's, who's served in government uh, would, would ratify this. I mean, we have fantastic men and women uh, that are serving our country all over the United States, all over the world. And uh, it's just a real honor for me to lead that. 
lead that workforce. And you know, as everybody knows, we're coming in starting today into the uh, holiday travel season. So I really wanted to spend some time with my team and uh, thank them for what they're doing and, and really encouraging them to uh, continue to perform in a, in a really exemplary manner as we go through this very busy and probably the busiest ever travel season. So I want to I want to pull some of the tips in terms of holiday travel in a second, but I also want to maybe broaden the horizon first. So uh, as Congressman Rogers had just mentioned, you were serving as the acting deputy secretary of the Department of Homeland right. Security. Uh, and you came into that also while simultaneously serving as administrator of TSA. So I, I'd be curious um, what your thoughts were going into that job and, and just the breadth and depth of the, of the department's mission. So uh, what kept you up at night and what kept you going all day? Great. Well, hey, it, it was a um, it was a real privilege to serve as the. Um, it, it was actually, in terms of government titles, this will really get all of you. It, I, I was the senior official performing the functions and duties of the deputy secretary. So, longest title I think I've ever had in my life. Um, but it was a real privilege to um, to for someone who was in this department when it was first established. Um, uh, and was actually behind the scenes in trying to um, stand up the department in the early years uh, with Secretary Ridge as our first secretary. Um, really privileged to, to be uh, working with Kevin McAleen, who was the acting secretary uh, at the time, and the two of us uh, as two individuals who really came from the DHS operating components. Uh, Kevin was the Commissioner of uh, U.S. Customs and Border Protection. I was the Administrator of the Transportation Security Administration. So for the very first time, we had two folks who had run um, uh, large operations inside DHS at the very top. And um, it was a really good experience to see the, the breadth and the scope of DHS. But you know, one of the things that, that I found particularly interesting is you know, I mentioned that I was there at the beginning. And, and you know, I had a 33-year career in the Coast Guard, had already spent two years in TSA. Um, and in TSA, we work, in, in the Coast Guard, work very closely with Customs and Border Protection. Um, and so I thought going into the job that I pretty much knew the department really, really well. And I think I did, but, but I, I, this was such an eye-opening experience because I really got to understand the breadth and the depth of, of what DHS does. I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, you look at the uh, U.S. Secret Service, for example, and everybody knows that they provide the protective services for our key protectees, beginning with the president and the, and the vice president. Um, what a lot of Americans don't know is the, the U.S. Secret Service works financial crimes, uh, and that's a core mission. Uh, for the Secret Service. And the Secret Service also runs the National Threat Assessment Process, which kind of makes sense given that they're providing protective services all around the country, that they have a key role in the threat assessment process for the U.S. government. Um, or, you know, I, I, I knew I knew FEMA because you know, FEMA Disaster uh, Response and Resiliency Organization, Coast Guard works alongside FEMA on a very regular basis. Um, but really to get into understand uh, FEMA's role in, uh, in building resilience, which has been a key emphasis uh, for FEMA over the past number of years and how successful they have been at that. And really I think we as a country have seen that success as we face natural disasters uh, over the last couple of years. Um, or uh, really understanding with Immigration and Customs Enforcement, an agency um, that is right at the center of, of our immigration uh, issues and, and seeing what Homeland Security Investigations, HSI, which is part of ICE, and you know, what piece that uh, hardly anybody ever hears about HSI is the work they do on child sexual exploitation and abuse. Uh, huge problem uh, around the world, huge problem here in the United States, and just really reassuring to see what a significant role uh, HSI was playing. But at the end of the day, as I traveled around, and I, I got to do a, a lot of travel uh, in the seven months I was uh, in the um, Deputy Secretary's chair, uh, I saw uniformly just outstanding men and women, all ages, all experiences, uh, just doing the mission uh, for their agencies, doing the mission of the department, uh, and doing it with honor and integrity. Um, and as an American, as somebody who believes in the strength of institutions, that was very, you know, it was something I expected to see, uh, but when you see it and you see the depth of it, um, I, I, I leave that position uh, and now I'm and very happy to be back in my TSA full chair, as the, as, as the ranking member mentioned, um, I, you know, I, I really got a good education uh, in, in that assignment and, uh, and came away with even a deeper appreciation for the value of, of uh, the Department of Homeland Security and, and really the value of the partnerships that we have all around this country and all around the world with private sector entities, non-government 
organizations um, with society in general. Um, and so I'm very happy to have had the opportunity um, and very happy to, to now get back into a full swing at, at TSA. And to the ranking member's uh, comment, which I appreciate very much, um, uh, ranking member Rogers has been a, an incredible supporter of the Department of Homeland Security. He was um, uh, and continues to be very supportive um, of me and my role at TSA. And, and one of the things that, that we worked on uh, pretty closely was a reauthorization of TSA, um, the first reauthorization of the agency since it was founded. Um, and we just celebrated, by the way, our, our 18th birthday on November 19th. Uh, of 2001, President uh, uh, George W. Bush signed the Aviation and Transportation Security Act, which formed TSA at Reagan uh, Airport um, in the um, uh, old terminal, if you will, which has a beautiful view of, of the tarmac, but at the time, that airport was still closed immediately following 9-11. Um, but, um, I, you know, one of the things that, that I was particularly interested in is leadership stability. Um, General Austin can appreciate this from his time uh, in the military as a, as a combatant commander. Um, uh, you know, TSA has had a lot of people going through the administrator's chair, and uh, and I think and, and I think the ranking member certainly agrees with me that having some stability in the position is critically important for the long-term success of the most public-facing part of the Department of Homeland Security. And so, um, when that reauthorization of TSA passed about a year and, and a couple of months ago. Um, uh, one of the elements in there was to create a five-year term for the administrator, very much like there's a five-year term for the FAA administrator. And uh, one of the things I, I did was I, I committed to uh, the ranking member and a number of other members of Congress that I would serve out that full five-year term. And that was one of the reasons why it was so important for me to get back um, to TSA and to get back into this role, because I've got two and a half more years uh, in, in this job, and I'm very much looking forward to doing other great things. Admiral, one, one quick nuts and bolts question, mm -hmm. since uh, a, a lot of people, uh, I think uh, Congressman Rogers said it right, TSA is the, is the mm -hmm. face of the department. That's what most people see on mm -hmm. a day in, day out basis. But from a sense of scale and scope, how many full-time employees at the Department of Homeland Security and then at TSA? Sure. Um, D DHS, number of employees, um, and, and I, I won't give you the full-time, part-time split yeah, 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 in yeah. numbers, but I will give it to you in percentages. Yeah. Um, DHS overall, 240,000 employees. So that's a big um, department, 240,000. Very, very big department. Um, TSA, roughly 63,000 um, employees, of which 90% are full-time employees. Um, and so it, it, it is a an organization, both parent department and TSA, it, these are agencies of scale. So from mm -hmm. a management perspective, it, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a big mission and it's a big responsibility for the leadership, so. It, it is, and, and, and one of the things that, um, that I have placed increasing emphasis on, and, and it, it, it has a lot to do with my uh, military background, is uh, the culture of, of agencies uh, and, the, and the vision that, that leaders provide for their agencies. And, and, uh, and that's another reason why having some leadership consistency is particularly important because I want to I wanna embed a culture in TSA that, uh, you know, I'll kind of draw a parallel back to DHS for a second. You know, both TSA, brand new agency, 18 years old, DHS, brand new cabinet department. DHS, a little bit unlike TSA, was an integration of a lot of uh, pre-existing agencies within our government and a military service within our government. Um, and we're both still working very hard on identifying uh, a, a, an established culture for both organizations. So uh, before we jump into to TSA questions, and you know I'm not going to let you escape without mm -hmm. talking about our canine program, which mm -hmm. is the very best, and, and you'll visit uh, uh, our dog soon. But mm -hmm. I, I, you did not mention cyber. And mm -hmm. you and I get to spend a day mm -hmm. every week together on the Solarium right. Commission in your role as Deputy Secretary. Mm -hmm. I think that the department's mission and the, the Cyber mm -hmm. uh, Security and Infrastructure Security Agency has, mm -hmm. uh, has, has done yeoman's work in a short yeah. amount of time. But yeah. you want to paint a little bit just because sure. uh, yeah. uh, obviously our College of Engineering is right. a very strong college thanks to our leadership and, and Dean Roberts yeah. who's here with us today. Mm -hmm. But I'd be curious. Uh, sure. uh, on your thoughts there. Yeah, no thanks. And, and CISA, Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency, as Frank mentioned, uh, brand new, a little over a year old, um, uh, and just doing a, you know, a, a, an incredible job uh, in a relatively short time as a standalone DHS uh, component. I would tell you that, uh, that as the um, person in the deputy's chair for seven months, 
I spent more time on CISA issues than any other issue in the department. Part of it was um, uh, related cool to the cybersecurity. It's cool set of issues. Cool <laughs> set of people. National security yeah. issues too. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and, and and really, when you look at the threats that are facing this nation, um, certainly a threat that's front and center for all of us, and uh, and a threat that uh, we know we need to do a lot more to be fully prepared for. Um, so, you know, Frank and I have been on the Cybersecurity uh, Solarium Commission now for, uh, since about, about May time for period, we'll be uh, wrapped up uh, shortly after the, uh, the turn of the year, I think March, April uh, time frame. But, you know, one of the things that, that's been uh, very beneficial for me personally is just to dive into cybersecurity issues um, because, I, you know, I thought I was fairly conversant in cyber issues, but after having spent uh, every week uh, a meeting for at least a couple of hours uh, with the commission, I, you know, I learned an awful lot, and that I also learned a lot uh, from uh, just my regular interactions with CISA. But with respect to um, to, to um, uh, programs here at Auburn, you know, one of the things that that uh, we do have authority now in law, uh, thanks to the ranking member, is um, the authority to design a new personnel system, a different personnel system uh, for our cyber workforce. And uh, we are about to roll that out probably, uh, I would say, um, uh, in the second quarter um, of calendar year 2020. Uh, but we've done an awful lot of work on it. And, and essentially what we've done, it, given the, the authorities we have in law, is to say, hey, rather than tweak an existing government procurement system uh, or, or uh, personnel system, we need to start from scratch and, and figure out what will make uh, uh, things work best for the interchange between the private sector, academia, uh, and, and government. And so I think when you see that uh, new personnel system roll out, you'll be very pleased with, with what we've done, but we really want to ease um, the transition between um, non-government and government work. Uh, we want to make the, um, uh, the continuance of security clearances much easier to do when you transition out of government work. And we also want to go to a system that, that really hires people for skills rather than hires them into a job, if you will. Um, and so it's a wholly different way uh, of looking at a personnel system uh, within the U.S. government. And it will be uh, put out in, in, in regulations so that uh, people can see what it is. But we, we're, we are very excited about this because we think it will, uh, one, strengthen the ties between the, the private sector, academia, and the department, um, and, and really just build up the overall intellectual capital um, that the government has available to it um, to deal with the, the very significant cybersecurity issues. Well, I can tell you Auburn University stands ready to help mm -hmm. uh, in, in terms of workforce needs and requirements on the cyber side. We, we do a ton with the Department of Defense. We do a, a bunch with the Department Department of Homeland Security and the past two days we actually hosted the Cyber Moonshot Initiative mm -hmm. right. so um, give us the requirements we'll get okay. you the uh, the best and the brightest to meet right. those requirements so so thank you for that and 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 one more question in your role as uh, acting deputy secretary so FEMA mm -hmm. so Lee County would tragically got hit with a, yes. a, a major um, uh, uh, incident, what was it, uh, about a year ago, and, and General Burgess mm -hmm. here, his home, uh, mm -hmm. fortunately everyone was okay, but his home was even, uh, what was even hit by the tornadoes, and, and I'd be curious what your thoughts are there. <laughs> Coast Guard has always had a recovery and, and response right. and recovery role, but, but, but did you learn something new about sort of where, where FEMA fit into the whole uh, department's process? Sure, and, and, and I think, you know, FEMA, if I, if I looked at uh, all the agencies in the Department of Homeland Security, one of the agencies that has progressed the most um, and is, is, is critically important to the uh, American uh, uh, citizens is, is FEMA. I mean, you know, look at disaster response and recovery uh, now. It's, it's wholly different um, than it was in 2005, for example. Um, and, and that's been due to a couple things. One is um, we now have a national response framework in place. It's been in place for a good number of years and it works. Um, and, and, and now when, when, when FEMA is looking at a disaster, of course, they're looking at it in close partnership with state and local government. Uh, and oftentimes international governments like in the Bahamas with Hurricane Dorian. Um, and, and we know automatically across the whole U.S. government now how we organize and, and how we, we approach the, uh, the upcoming uh, disaster or one that might all of a sudden appear uh, on our doorstep. But a key part of, I think, what, what FEMA will be best known for in the future, if I could say, if you ask somebody five years from now that very same question, 
they would talk a lot about the resilience that, that FEMA has built in um, because there's not a discussion that occurs on recovery without talking about resilience. You know, how do we build more resilience into building codes, for example? How do we build more resilience into citizen response and citizen capability? Uh, importantly, how do we build more resilience into our communication systems mm -hmm. so that we can communicate with our citizens and let them know what the status is and where they can go uh, for assistance? So, you know, I, I think that the, the leadership of of FEMA um, has, has really done a great job with their whole team, uh, but their whole team is, uh, you know, it's the state of Alabama, it's, it's the city of Auburn. I mean, this, this is a team that is, that is deep with expertise and, you know, I think gone are the days really that, that, that the levels of government in the United States are having a lot of arguments with each other um, on disaster response. That seems to be a very, at this point in time, a very w well oiled machine and, and I do remember well the tornadoes that came through here, I think in March of, of last year, um, and uh, Secretary Nielsen uh, was down. I mean, you know, it's just that, you know, the, the response we have and the leadership focus, the focus from the White House, um, uh, irrespective of administrations, uh, has always been there um, to get us back on our feet as quickly as we can. Let's pivot to your day job, okay. your uh, latest responsibilities um, mm -hmm. at TSA. So we'll jump to holiday travel okay. since all of our students are right. uh, heading uh, uh, home and many of yeah. them will be uh, using planes, trains, and, mm -hmm. and, and automobiles. But if we can first focus on the threat uh, mm -hmm. environment and, yeah. and I think our mm -hmm. attention as a country waxes and wanes based on episodes and events. And, mm -hmm. and, and obviously the Department of Homeland Security was stood up in large part due to an aviation to 9-11 to right. and the horrific attacks that mm -hmm. occurred on that day. Can, can you mm -hmm. bring us sort of up to speed sure. on the threat environment, mm -hmm. uh, modalities of attack, and then a mm -hmm. little bit, I don't think everyone's fully uh, aware of the breadth of TSA's mission. It mm -hmm. is intermodal. Mm -hmm. um, it incorporates not only aviation, where, which everyone sees, but you've got other transportation right. uh, needs and requirements. So rail, mm -hmm. um, obviously trucking industries mm -hmm. and others. So I'd, I'd be curious if you can sort of paint sure. a picture that. Sure, um, well, let's talk about the threat first. Um, I, you know, I think um, sometimes people think that uh, given the success we've had um, against Al Qaeda and ISIS, that the threat is diminished. Um, I, I would not agree with that at all. I think the threat is absolutely there. The threat is different. Uh, it's not that it's diminished. Um, uh, I think it's there uh, just as strongly, if not stronger, than it was before, and it's a little bit harder to get at because uh, now the threat is more distributed rather than centralized. Um, and so we are always concerned uh, with a foreign terrorist organization threat. But as we've seen in this country too, we're concerned about um, a targeted violence in, in this country. It's a continuing threat to the safety and security of the citizens of this country. Um, Secretary McAleenan, when he was uh, acting secretary in September, put out a new strategic framework for countering terrorism and targeted violence. And what that calls for is a, an increasing focus on whole of society efforts. You know, we started out, uh, Frank, when you, when you and I were early on in this department, we would talk about, hey, we need to get whole of government um, together so that the government, you know, between the federal government and the state, local and tribal ter and territorial governments, we're all working together. Then we moved to whole of nation to go beyond governments and get into more of civil society. Um, and then whole of community. But, but, well, now we're into whole of society because one of the things that, that's particularly concerning about the threat we face now is uh, individual self-radicalizing that are, are not going to be visible. Um, you know, General Burgess knows from his time um, in, in government uh, that, that um, you know, we, we, we have uh, amazing capability um, to detect threats from an intelligence perspective. Uh, what concerns us though now is that some of the indicators of that or some of the centralized organizations that would be key concerns um, of ours are now either more distributed or individuals are radicalized in ways that we can't detect. But you know, whenever you see an attack in this country, pretty much by and large, when we, we, we look into, okay, what happened here? There was somebody, whether it was a parent um, a sibling, uh, a coworker, um, or just somebody standing next to somebody that saw something that wasn't quite right. And so one of the things that, that we've emphasized a lot, and uh, Secretary Janet Napolitano, when she was secretary, coined the phrase, if you see something, say something. And, and boy, I, I'll tell you, if that isn't true, um, and really what we're trying to do more so now than ever, uh, you know, Secretary Napolitano started it, uh, we're, we are continuing to build on that foundation is how do we enable that to happen and, and how do we allow people 
um, to give us information so that we can take the proper security actions based on the information they provide. And I'll bring it into an aviation um, uh, realm right away is that, you know, I, I think of all the people standing in queue lines for a very short period of time, by the way, um, but, uh, <laughs> but, um, uh, th th but are standing in line, uh, and, and there's a couple issues there. One is large gatherings of people are things we should try to avoid. Um, and, and there are ways to avoid it. There are configuration issues with infrastructure and certainly there are speed issues with security processes um, without sacrificing the effectiveness of that process. But oftentimes, you know, somebody will hear something that somebody says or somebody does while they're in line. Um, and you know, how, do, how do we create a mechanism for that individual to voice that concern rather than just being silent about it? Or if I take it to, to, to the officers that all of you see when you go through uh, airport security, one of the things that I've encouraged the officers to do is um, eye to eye with passengers. Look people in the eye. Don't be looking down, looking at their bags only. Eye to eye is very important. And have a conversation um, because we're looking for those indicators that might say, hey, there's something that doesn't feel quite right here. Um, uh, and, and how do we address it um, uh, for the safety and security of everybody that's, e that's in that airport or going into that, um, uh, into that airplane? Um, and Frank, you mentioned the, you know, the breadth of TSA's min missions. We are responsible for surface transportation security from a federal perspective. Um, not a lot of people realize that. Um, and but pipelines and, as well. And, pipe, and pipelines is part of surface. And, and remember that, that when TSA, you know, transportation, so when TSA was first established, it was part of the Department of Transportation. Uh, so essentially what happened is uh, within all the departmental modes, uh, whether it's you know, rail, buses, pipelines, et cetera, um, within the departmental modes, they pulled the security element out and put it in TSA. So that's why TSA has national responsibility for pipeline security. The major distinction is that we don't actually do that security. We don't operationalize that. We work through the owners and operators of our transportation systems. But you know, pipelines, if you, if you think about uh, vulnerability issues, and we just talked about resilience in terms of FEMA, um, uh, you know, we think of the electric grid and electrical infrastructure. Well, you, you need to take that a couple steps down and, and look now in the United States where 40% you know, of our electric power generation is fueled by natural gas. And that, that number is increasing uh, day, in, uh, day after day. Um, and so we need to be very concerned about natural gas pipeline security. Uh, that's something that, you know, Frank, that, that um, the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency takes from an industrial con control system cyber perspective uh, in very close partnership with us uh, from a physical security perspective and in close partnership with the Department of Energy uh, from, a, from a, a pipeline network uh, perspective. So, you know, key priorities. Um, and to go into, into how they travel for a second. Yep. Um, you know, this is the first day, as I, as I mentioned, of the holiday travel season. Uh, a couple things that, 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 um, that I would just offer um, to folks is we do have trusted traveler programs inside the Department of Homeland Security, and this gets you expedited screening, uh, whether it's screening going through a domestic security checkpoint like TSA provides, or screening as you enter the country uh, from an international location. Um, so there's global entry programs uh, and TSA pre-check programs. Uh, one of the things that I don't think a lot of people realize is that if you sign up for global entry, which costs a little bit more than pre-check, so global entry is $100 for five years, pre-check is 85. If you have global entry, you have pre-check, it's automatic. Um, and uh, one of the things that, w that we are in the process of doing now is in TSA, is making pre-check even more attractive um, to our trusted travelers. Um, in legislation, um, we, we are required to only uh, put uh, passengers in the pre-check lanes who have what we call a KTN or a known traveler number. Basically, that's a global entry registrant or a pre-check registrant or a, uh, a, a person who is employed by the Department of Defense, Department of Homeland Security. Um, uh, and, and so there are some people that had been in the pre-check lanes based on rule sets that are now moving into the regular lanes to make the pre-check lanes more for that pure trusted traveler population. What that will result in is even shorter wait lines in pre-check and pre-check wait lines across the country. If I pulled up this morning's report, I can guarantee you it's five minutes or less on average across the country, but there are gonna be local anomalies at certain points in time. Uh, but, by, but by and large, five minutes or less uh, in pre-check. And, and we are looking at ways that once we introduce some new technology into our checkpoints, that we can even provide more convenience 
first for pre-check passengers and then in a modified way for the rest of the passenger set. So let me just mm -hmm. step back. You, you, you shared a, a whole lot of information there. I just want to unpack a couple of quick points. Mm -hmm. So from a threat perspective, uh, we still have to recognize that the counterterrorism issues are significant and right. real. Yes. So w in addition to taking bad actors and mm -hmm. terrorist leaders off the battlefield, we've got a, an ideological set of issues. Yep. The, the ideology lives and, mm -hmm. and, and that needs to be part of our mm -hmm. recognition and response and, and it can manifest itself in different shapes, sizes, forms and flavors, mm -hmm. uh, including self-radicalized. Right. On the cyber side, mm -hmm. we're dealing with a wide range of threat actors from nation state actors, uh, the obvious ones, Russia, China, Iran, North mm -hmm. Korea, but, but many others as mm -hmm. well as well as everything in between there right. down to individuals. Right. So um, when you look at sort of TSAs, uh, mm -hmm. I, I, I mean, so you have not only the, the terrorism threat, you have nation state threat mm -hmm. actors that are under the rubric of DHS mm -hmm. in one way or another, which is, which is a mm -hmm. huge set of issues, mm -hmm. a huge mission set. How good do you feel our intelligence is right now, our information sharing, Mm -hmm. through the department, with our transnational, uh, with our uh, allies overseas, mm -hmm. uh, as well as yep. with our state and local right. uh, partners. Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's good. It's getting better every single day. And, and um, you know, when I was um, the deputy secretary, uh, I spent a significant amount of time traveling internationally um, to work agreements with our foreign partners as to how we share information. Uh, and, and we targeted those engagements based on partners that we thought uh, would be most beneficial um, to American security. Uh, and, and we have a number of programs within the department that facilitates that information sharing. One of the things that we emphasize with them, if to go to the foreign terrorist fighter um, uh, aspect of the threat, for example, which now has a new meaning to it, given the, the events in Syria, um, right. is that we, you know, we have biometrics on a, on a good number of those foreign terrorist fighters. Can we put biometric programs, the answer is yes, can we put biometric programs in place in other countries uh, that we share biometric data with them based on our databases so that we know if somebody is attempting to enter the United States through South America, for example, as soon as they land in South America, we know they're there. Do you think um, that could be yeah. built out with DOD even further? Um, General Austin at CENTCOM, was yep. there, there were some pilots I know. That yeah, no, I think it can. I, I think the, the key thing is, um, to build it out with our, you know, uh, sometimes it takes our partners um, a while to come to an agreement that they want to enter into into these kind of arrangements with the United States, and that was the reason for my emphasis at a very senior level was to say, hey, th you know, this this is why this is important. But one of the, one of the areas where we've gotten even better at explaining is what are our data retention mm -hmm. um, standards mm -hmm. in the United States and, and what privacy protections do we provide for the information, uh, particularly important with our European partners. Um, and so you know, we're having a more wholesome and more robust uh, conversation, but the whole idea is is let's share as much data as we can. And you know, as you know, um, you know we have a very very close relationship with our Five Eyes partners, um, and that is continuing to get deeper and deeper. But we are also developing very close relationships with a number of other partners out there, not at the level of Five Eyes, but really driving towards this this more robust exchange of information. Um, if Which I could, is critical from an oh, aviation. Yeah. I mean, it is yep. an international hub, right. and there's only so much you can control, right? right. There, absolutely. And, and um, you know, we, we, one of the, the um, uh, issues that I work on a lot, uh, and Ranking Member Rogers mentioned this, is you know, we've been um, working very hard to raise the global bar in aviation security. Is, you know, because we have, you know, 280 airports around the world that have direct flights into the United States. Uh, we want to make sure that aircraft flying over U.S. airspace, largely carrying American citizens in them, are secure as they enter our country or fly over our airspace. Um, and so we've established a set of standards internationally that carriers have to perform at the gates. And if you've traveled internationally, you've probably experienced this, where you go through the security checkpoint uh, at the international airport, and then when you get to the gate, you'll find additional security being required um, by the carriers before you board their aircraft. That's required by um, TSA um, through a process called the Security Directive or Emergency Amendment Process. But really, to raise the bar, one of, one of the, the, the things that we're trying very hard to do is to get our international partner countries to do those measures 
at their central checkpoints so that we get away from the gate measure piece, which is better for passengers. It's certainly better for the carriers. And the gates were never really designed space-wise to be able mm -hmm. to do this. But the, the significant security benefit is that everyone now going through that international airport has better security. Um, and, and we've seen some good results uh, on that. I'll give you a, probably the best example is um, over the past year, uh, we've asked passengers to take more things out of their carry-on bags when they go through a screening checkpoint. The reason for that was to declutter the x-ray image that the officers are reviewing. Um, and particularly, we want them to take out powders um, and foods food items. So if you're carrying food items, we, we typically ask passengers to take those out. Um, that process has been adopted by a number of international partners. They basically took our standard operating procedures and said, hey, that, that works for us. We'll put that in place. And so we were able internationally to put, to, to address a powders threat primarily um, across the world at our last point of departure airports relatively quickly and in many cases at their central checkpoints rather than at the gate. So you're feeling good. I feel. I, I think the trend line is is there. Um, I, you know, I I always worry. You know, my job is to worry about the threat. Yeah. Um, and and what I want my officers to always worry about is the threat. And and you know, a, a concern is when you've been successful for 18 years. Yeah. You you need to keep that that focus on absolutely um, because um, the th like I said, the threat is still there. It it it, it actually is in many ways harder now than it was after 9-11. In, in many ways it is. Yeah. And, 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 and you know we're going to get to canines in a second, mm -hmm. but I'd, I, I'd, I'd like a question, uh, uh, your thoughts on, on workforce writ large. Mm -hmm. uh, first on the positive plus side mm -hmm. and, and, and anything that surprised you, and, and then maybe a question on sort of whether or not there have been a couple of incidents that were a little concerning of insider threats. Mm -hmm. I'd be curious uh, how you're handling some of those issues. Sure. Um, as I said earlier, you know, workforce uniformly is outstanding. Uh, when you have 240,000 people at the department level and 60 plus thousand at the TSA level, you know, you have, you know, between one and five percent of, of issues that, that you need to deal with. Um, and the key is to, to deal with them as quickly and as forthrightly and fairly as you possibly can. Um, I am very happy in, in, uh, in TSA and DHS both in, in that when you look at the annual survey that we take of, of government um, civilian employees, it's called the FEVS, Federal Employee Viewpoint Survey. Our results are increasing every single year, so that's, that's good. My challenge to, to, to the TSA workforce when I got back, as soon as I got back, is I said, hey, really good, we, we've improved again in our Federal Employee Viewpoint Survey. But I want to see an improvement go from, you know, rather than doing, you know, three or four percent per year, which is good, I want to see 10 percent per year or more. Because um, I'm of the firm belief, I think everybody in this room would agree with me, is that a, a motivated and satisfied workforce equals better security. Absolutely. It also equals, by the way, better facilitation of passenger travel, which is a key focus um, of both CBP and TSA uh, and the Coast Guard. Um, and so, you know, we are looking for um, uh, procedures um, and, and uh, workplace culture issues to um, further advance that. And then importantly, uh, and we've had uh, tremendous support from Capitol Hill, is putting more technology uh, in place. And one of the things that, that we're kind of wrestling with a little bit, I, I would say just a little bit because I'm very comfortable with this, is we will probably have some different technology solutions at different airports. Because um, the dilemma is, do you have, can, can you just across 450 airports in the U.S. change all the technology and do you want to change it all at the same time, uh, all with the same piece of gear? Or do you have the opportunity to make some technology improvements now at certain airports? Um, and, you know, a passenger might notice a little difference from one mm -hmm. airport to the mm -hmm. other. My vote is on, hey, let's make the technology improvements now, kind of going back to and that can threat. Can you layer that in? Do you have the, yep. the, the green lights to do that? Uh, we, we, we do. And, and, and the, other, the other thing that we have, which... not every airport's the same either. They're right? not. And they've got different... Yeah. Right. Vulnerabilities. No, not every airport's the same. Not every maritime port's the same. Every, everything's, you know, <laughs> you know, the, you've seen one, you've seen yeah, one. The, you know, the core is there, but but the, but there are significant differences uh, one to the other. And, and, you know, one of the things that we have benefited significantly uh, by is we have the authority in law um, to accept gifts from uh, private sector entities. And so uh, we don't solicit gifts because that's that's not proper. But if but if an, a private sector entity offers to gift us technology, um, then we have the authority to accept that. And I know many of you fly through Atlanta Airport. If you look at all those very new fancy um, um, 
screening uh, systems where you know it takes your carry-on bags and brings it into the X-ray and then um, gives it to you at the end. They're, they're a little bit longer. Um, they're they're a different design than we've had in the past. Um, those were all gifted um, by air carriers um, because you know they saw the benefit from a passenger experience perspective and from a throughput perspective. Hmm. Um, and you know, we got you know, tens of millions of dollars in gifts, but that's really my point is, you know, I was able to, with their generosity and their partnership, to improve the um, security at the airports and improve the passenger experience at the airports at no cost to the U.S. government. And we have different types of those systems um, throughout rather than you know, everything, you know, as we used to say in the military, a Mark I, Mod Zero, uh, solution across the entire system, which is simpler for training, surely, and simpler simpler for um, maintenance, and simpler for explaining to your uh, passengers what they need to do. But it does have sometimes a cost at your speed of delivery of technology, and and really the technology is changing so fast anyway. Um, uh, you know, I, I I'm very comfortable with putting quick technology solutions in place at certain airports and largely based on quickly. private partnerships. Yeah. No, that's awesome. I mean, a, a grand challenge of sorts mm -hmm. around technology to help enable and incentivize right. travel. I, mm -hmm. I, I, I think a number in the university would uh, mm -hmm. support that as well. All right, let's go to, to canines. Okay. So, um, yeah. and, uh, Who has the best canine program uh, in the world? All right. War Eagle. <laughs> um, in all sincerity, you're going to, uh, Calvin Johnson, our yep. dean of vet med, will be, uh, um, and his amazing team, mm -hmm. uh, will, will be visiting our uh, program mm -hmm. very soon. Uh, and I forgot to mention when, when we were talking about, uh, so Huntsville has just exploded, and yep. FBI has TDAC, no pun right. intended, with the explosion. But they right. do a lot of the uh, <laughs> bomb tech kind of work there. But I, I would be very curious, yeah. um, uh, firstly, you just told me today that TSA actually is the largest, um, give or take, with Department of Defense mm -hmm. uh, 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 has the largest workforce of canines. We, we have the largest explosive detection canine program in the world. Um, DOD was bigger um, than we were, um, and as, as you may know, we, we train our canines in San Antonio, uh, right alongside the DOD working dog program, and we have had for years um, a, really a model um, uh, level of cooperation between the Department of Defense and the Department of Homeland Security in how we uh, both train our dogs, how we provide health care for our dogs, um, and, and facility investments. So that's been you know, something I would put up there as, as certainly one of the best I've ever seen. Um, with respect to canines overall... Unless you, you want to see the Delta Force and Navy SEALs of dogs, you're going to see those today. So I'm no, looking forward no, to that. No. Yeah, no, no. And, and, and really, you know, um, I'm very much looking forward to this afternoon because, um, you know, I've wanted to get down to Auburn, um, and we, we were finally able to find the schedule opportunity to, to, to do that, to see uh, your program here. And, and the program that we have in TSA is um, uh, very closely coordinated with the Auburn program. So I'm just looking forward to seeing how we can, we can strengthen that even further uh, as we go forward. But, you know, we have uh, in TSA about 1,100 dogs. Um, as ranking member mentioned, we, uh, that's split between, not evenly, but split between uh, state and local uh, law enforcement agencies where we train those law enforcement officers, uh, we buy the dog, we provide them a dog, and we recertify the dog every year. Uh, so it's a really good program, and plus we provide maintenance uh, money every year to those police departments, and they're a, they're a key part of our capability. Uh, and we also have a very significant portion um, that are operated by the by the TSA handlers. Um, and you know, I, I will tell you that um, uh, two things that are I think pretty pretty apparent with, with canines. One is they are outstanding at detection. Uh, and you can train a canine, um, and, and we'll see more of that this afternoon, I'm sure, to train as, as threats emerge. So as the, as the threat changes, hey, you know, I need, to, I need to train my dog to detect this substance where we hadn't trained them to do that before. You can do that relatively quickly in a canine program. Uh, it's, it's, very, it's very impressive. And the efficacy is pretty amazing. Absolutely. Um, and, and they're cute. And they're cute. And, and the other thing is... Floppy ears. Floppy ears, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm with you. Um, and, and the other thing about it is that um, for, you know, a, a lot of a security system is the deterrence that your system provides to bad actors. And, uh, and, and we know from our own work, uh, and I'm sure you know this from your work here at Auburn, that, that uh, uh, the presence of canines has a significant deterrent effect um, on bad actors. 
Uh, and then if I could just go to the to the insider piece for a second, you know, our canines. Yeah, I was going to let I was going to pull pull you back. Yeah, them, but yeah, yeah. The um, the the uh, our canines are, are present in the checkpoints. Uh, we have a um, an outstanding third party canine program, not TSA dogs, but dogs that are certified through a third party certifier now doing uh, screening in cargo facilities, and that's been a huge boon um, to our security capability. And the carriers are really very much. Um, for this program, but you know we, we move our dogs throughout the airport, so they're not just at the uh, screening checkpoints. They're on the um, you know on the operational areas of the airport in in uh, in check baggage uh, in the public areas of the airport because their presence and just their their detection capability is really unmatched. Uh, I'm looking to continue. I don't have enough canines. I mean, I have I have a lot, but there 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 are just not enough um, and. You know, we've gotten really good support um, to grow our program. Ranking member has been key uh, in, in, in advocating for that. And, and then as he mentioned, you know, we are looking to, how do, how do we develop more domestic breeding capability in the U.S.? We buy uh, in TSA about 300 canines per year. Um, you know, my preference certainly would be to buy all 300 here in the U.S., but the source of, of supplies don't allow us to do that, and and really so that's how, a legitimate issue. It's right? a very big. It's, it's a national security on issue. Foreign yep. breeding. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and and so you know, I see nothing but future growth for this program, and 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 really, you know, we we are also very good at um, sharing what we learn from agency to agency, uh, or for uh, or from university to agency. Um, you know, we do within our security system. We are always doing red team tests, double blind red team tests. And oftentimes these tests, and you've probably seen news reports that say, oh, okay, look at this percentage of detection um, based on uh, a, a test that was done by uh, somebody outside TSA on, on system performance. Um, while I don't dispute those results, I would say that those results need to be taken um, in Contact. terms of the TOTO of, of your security system. Um, but we are always doing red team testing to figure out what is working and what is not working because I want to know where those vulnerabilities are before my adversary does. Uh, that, that's good yeah. to hear. I want to make sure we have a little bit of time mm -hmm. for some questions from the audience if there, there are any. We've got about... Here any time. Six minutes. Okay. So, uh, do we have any takers? You, you mentioned five eyes a couple of times. Could you explain to the audience sure. what that is and why that's Yeah, no, thanks, sir. Uh, good, good point. Uh, five eyes partners um, uh, UK, United Kingdom, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, and the United States. Um, and we have special uh, information sharing arrangements uh, with the five eyes partners. Um, and additionally, we meet as Five Eyes partners on a whole range of issues on a very regular basis. Um, you know, I've done several of those meetings just in the seven months I was uh, in the Department of Homeland Security. So it's a, it's a very strong uh, relationship. And the, and the beauty of, of Five Eyes is because we're all pretty much seeing the same intelligence, we can have a very robust discussion about, hey, given this intelligence, how do we best address it uh, amongst us? And we very much try um, to coordinate our operational response to intelligence information across the Five Eyes partners. So it's a significant uh, influencing block internationally because other countries look at, hey, what are Five Eyes doing? Because they have the most advanced intelligence systems and they coordinate closely with each other. If they're doing it, we might need to take a very close look at what we're doing. So very, very, very influential um, partnership and, and one that I know every senior leader in DHS wants to, and DOD, wants to continue to, um, to foster. C can I just add, uh, uh, mm -hmm. so with, with the Five Eyes relationship, mm -hmm. I, I mean, it stems back to World War II, and right. initially with sharing of signals intelligence, mm -hmm. which quite honestly won the war. Mm -hmm. um, it helped us win the war. But now you've seen the Five Eye relationship expand well outside the SIGINT, the Signals Intelligence right. community, to include the broader intelligence community, but also law enforcement. Mm -hmm. So you've got mm -hmm. strands of that Five Eyes relationship that has so much blood, sweat, tears, and history, yep. and scar tissue, and right. everyone wants to be a member of the Five Eyes, but they miss the point. That's, mm -hmm. that's experience, that's history, mm -hmm. that's scar tissue, that's being in the foxhole mm -hmm. together for yep. a very long period of time. Yep. But when you're looking at TSA's mission, mm -hmm. you don't have the luxury of just being able to rely on our Five Eyes right. partners. You've got 
allies such as Japan that are mm -hmm. not part of the Five Eyes. You've got mm -hmm. NATO countries that mm -hmm. uh, are important. You've right. got big regions, India and other countries mm -hmm. uh, that you need to be looking to, Israel and the mm -hmm. Middle East, elsewhere. So I'd be very curious how you go about lashing up sort of the TSA function with your counterparts in new countries. Is this working pretty well? It's working pretty well. I, you know, I, th I think, you know, every one of those countries, as you said, Frank, that they want to be, and I, I get this question not infrequently, is <laughs> uh, how do I become a Five Eyes country? And, and they and miss I, the point, they, right? And, that, and that's, that's just blood, it. sweat, and tears. It, yeah. Um, uh, you know, th this, is, this is a very unique uh, group of folks, but that doesn't mean that we can't have a close partnership with you exactly. um, as well. And, um, you know, there are a number of, uh, from aviation security, a number of key influencer countries um, that we are continuing to work on to develop even a closer working relationship with them um, and improve our information sharing with them um, to more and more sensitive information. Um, and sometimes uh, in aviation security, the information is sensitive but not highly classified sometimes. And so, you know, it's, it's easy. For example, if we, and we do want to do this, if we want to start to harmonize detection standards at checkpoints, um, because right now there's a European standard and there's an, a U.S. standard, um, ours is, is um, uh, stronger, um, for sure, um, and more quickly updated. Um, but there are some elements of the European standard that are also critically critically um, beneficial that we're looking to adopt. Um, how, how do we work with those partners to get more harmonization of standards? Because, you know, I look at this too from a, from a purely business perspective, if you will. Um, if I want to put technology out across a large system, so to give you a, a sense of scale, uh, U.S. system has about 2,400 um, screening check check lanes, just the lanes, so 2,400. Um, and so we are a significant buyer. So when we establish a standard, that standard uh, draws a lot of industry attention around the globe. Um, but I, I look at, hey, can I, can I make that market even bigger? by bringing in uh, the European standard into, into ours and, and harmonizing them a lot more so that manufacturers are not doing separate R&D, which is expensive and drives up cost, um, for different major buyers of, of screening technology equipment. And then, um, you know, I'll kind of go back to a, to a DHS issue for a second. You know, we, we now have a joint requirements council in, in DHS, which is very similar, and we learned a lot DOD. from our DOD partners of how do, you, how do you drive jointness in this system. Um, but, you know, I look at this, I'll, I'll take it from a pure TSA perspective. I buy tons of x-ray equipment. Well, you know, why doesn't that ha harmonize with the Secret Service and with Customs and Border Protection? We'll also buy a lot of this equipment because if we buy it all together, we're going to be a bigger market mover and we can get better pricing, which means if I get better pricing, I can buy more to improve security faster. Absolutely. Yeah. And DOD can marry up the QDR with the Palm process. Right. You've got the bottom-up review with the QHS, Quadrennial right. Homeland Security Review, which can, Admiral, unfortunately we're out of time, but I, I, I wanted to thank you on behalf of Auburn for thank your you. service every Thanks. day. Uh, uh, and, and for the women and men uh, under your mm -hmm. leadership. Thank you for joining us today. If there are any burning questions, you'll be around uh, sure a little bit yeah. to mingle. Yeah. Um, uh, so thank you, Admiral Pekoski, yeah. and uh, thank you. Uh, I appreciate thank it. Thank you, and let, let me just throw a thanks back to you too, Frank. I mean, you know, Frank is, is, a, is a key leader in, in security issues in this country. Uh, uh, no one would, would ever dispute that. And Frank is a member of the Homeland Security Advisory uh, committee provides key advice to all of us senior leaders uh, in the department. A uh, great colleague of mine on the, uh, and, and really the intellectual leader uh, yeah, in lots of that. ways of the Cyberspace uh, uh, Commission. So, you know, it's really a, it's a pleasure to be down here with all of you. Thank you for what you're doing at Auburn University, and thanks, Frank, Frank thanks for your leadership. And then, really, to Ranking Member Rogers, um, you know, I firmly believe in, in oversight by our Congress. We are a stronger agency. Um, because of the oversight we receive, and, and uh, the ranking member um, has been a key leader in that. He's made us better in canine uh, detection capability. He's made us better, um, certainly in uh, technology in our in our checkpoints. He's made us better in looking at how do we improve the base of the capacity of the United States to provide 
um, technology solutions to us, and he's made us better in terms of his support for the men and women in my workforce. And, and so I would just end, hey, this is Thanksgiving. Um, <laughs> thank you to all of you, you. For, for, having, uh, for having me here. And really, you know, I, I, just to publicly thank um, the workforces um, uh, within the Department of Homeland Security, within our entire U.S. government. I mean, our, our government is a marvel to, to watch, particularly uh, as many of my colleagues um, uh, in, in the front row know, when you visit internationally, you come back and, and you look at problems that they're dealing with that, that we have um, put good solutions and good processes in place for. So thank you, and everybody. Well, thank you for that, because you know, people really only recognize it when something goes awry, right. and there's so much that doesn't. So mm -hmm. thank you for that leadership, and I'm gonna give my one Mike Rogers plug. Okay. Space Corps, Space Force, this was a yeah, Paul yeah. Revere and a pioneer in that, yeah. and marry that up with cyber, mm -hmm. that's the future. So uh, Admiral Pekoski, thank you, and thank you all for joining us today. Thank you, appreciate it. Thanks, Frank. Thanks. That was great, thank you.